back to the show, returning champion, Linda Nelson. How are you doing, Linda? Hey, Alex. I'm doing great and uh, honored to be back again. Of course. I think, you know, we last time we spoke was about a year ago this time, around the time of AFM. And uh, and I think it's going to be a yearly thing. We, we should just do it every year, if not monthly. We should just do a show monthly because things are changing so fast. <laughs> it's, it's so true. And, and I know that for a fact because uh, I've had several people recently tell me that, oh, I heard about you because I listened to uh, Alex Ferrari's podcast. And so we were going to do this and that, that relative to the deliverables. And I said, well, you know what? Things have changed <laughs> since then. So we have a new deliverables document and, and, the, and what the, is happening in the industry is changing because they would start to talk about things. Well, we got to do TVOD first. You know, we'll do this TVOD window. And then, you know, I don't know about... Uh, I don't AVOD. Know about, uh, AVOD. <laughs> we'll we'll get we're gonna get into TVOD and AVOD in, in a minute. But I wanted to ask okay. you about deliverables. Like and this is something that people listening have to understand. I've been in post production for twenty odd years. Uh, so I'm very well aware about deliverables. I've delivered over fifty features. I, I get it. I remember a time where deliverables were pretty stable. Like it was pretty much the same kind of physical deliverables and and things, but it, things are changing almost so rapidly. Like, first of all, 1080p is still the standard, right? You, you please put away the whole myth that 4K is an absolute necessity. Okay, that is absolutely true. Uh, I would say the only thing that that we don't take anymore is SD or standard right. definition. Correct. Okay, it just doesn't look good on an 80 inch television. <laughs> So uh, <laughs> not so much. <laughs> no. And uh, and and we feel bad about that because our first indie film is on SD and it looks awful. <laughs> I know I put mine in the other I put mine in the other day and I was like, oh, ouch. Let me just at but, least blow it up to 720. <laughs> right. Now, where it stands today, and this could change in six months, is that everyone except for Netflix will take hd mm -hmm. okay and there are variations on hd uh so uh, uh, what we insist on getting is a 1920 by 1080 prores 422 hq two channel stereo that is our minimum and required format because everyone except for netflix will take that uh netflix now does require 4k really uh yes so you're not going on Netflix without 4K and professional sound. Um, Does it need you know, to be 5.1 surround sound or can it be stereo? Yes. No, it needs to be 5.1. And, and this is another thing. Uh, uh, the the, the 5.1 that is required by most, by most platforms is not a six-channel 5.1. It's an actually an eight-channel 5.1. And that's because in addition to the regular 5.1, it has two tracks, two stereo tracks attached. That yeah. seven and eight is left and right stereo. And the reason they want that file is because their software can detect what a user is going to play back, you know, the movie on. So if you have a television and you have surround sound settings set, Amazon, for example, or iTunes can detect, oh, they they can they need they can have 5.1, but if they see that you don't have 5.1, then they're just going to put uh, deliver uh, stereo to you. So that's why they want that eight track, you know, eight channel stereo. Very 5.1 for right now, and in about six or eight right. months, it could be 8K. I mean, we don't know. Like <laughs> things are changing I, I so rapidly. Not. I I hope not to. Trust me, I. I, I did one of my one of the most popular podcasts I ever had was Don't Shoot in 4K. And people <laughs> lost their minds. This is back in 2015. People lost their minds and, and there was a rationale. It's still, I mean, it, the world has just changed so much. I, I think people should shoot in K, but they don't necessarily yeah. at the Master. time have to finish in 2K. Yeah, or not 2K, 2K, I mean 4K. 4K. Sorry, right, 4K. Sorry. But now we got, we're talking about cameras that have 12K that are affordable. We're talking about well, it. And, and that's great. And we're, we're about, uh, 
to buy a, a new red camera, and I think we're going to get 8K. Sure. And what what's great about being able to shoot that is that in post you can recompose the frame, mm -hmm. and that's an incredible option. Uh, you know, so it can oftentimes save you from having to do a two camera shoot. Absolutely. Oh, absolutely. You, I've gotten much, a lot of coverage uh, shooting 4K, just even yeah. 4K and, and, and zooming sure. in. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. But as Werner Herzog says, when you reframe in post, it is the tools of the coward. Uh, <laughs> well, Werner, I'm sorry. We're all cowards. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> now, the, the elephant in the room that we haven't spoken about yet is COVID. Um, it is is completely thrown the entire planet upside down, let alone our little corner of the business uh, and industry. How do you see COVID changing the distribution side of the business? What are the platforms looking for? Is there a lack of content? Um, how is it changing? Well, so far, I don't think there's a, a lack of content simply because films, there were all of these movies going into post as COVID started. So all of those films have been being edited and are now coming out of post and coming to distributors to be uh, put up on platforms. But I think we will start to see uh, a diminished number of films because there hasn't been any new production. So I think by, say, January or February, we're going to start to see uh, fewer films being submitted uh, for us because... Uh, everyone, even editors, uh, are stuck at home, you know, so they're editing faster, you know, filmmakers that right. maybe had day jobs, and so they had to edit, you know, at night, uh, now are finding that they have more time on their hands, and they're, they're editing, you know, quicker than they normally would have. So I, we're seeing a lot of content and a lot of submissions. Our submissions have probably tripled uh, during covid so wow. unfortunately, uh, part of, uh, you know, the downside of that is that we've had to become more selective in the films that we take because we can only handle a certain number of films. Um, you know, it's, it's very time consuming for us to do the encoding and delivery and QC. So there's only four of us. We have four people in our company. And, and so there is a limit to how many we can handle. Uh, the good thing is that that is improving the quality of our catalog, but at the same time, I kind of miss uh, that feeling of being a champion for brand new filmmakers. We always loved that idea that we could work with filmmakers that were having a hard time getting distribution from like bigger companies. But the platforms, so. but the platforms themselves aren't accepting new filmmakers and, and maybe lower quality films that might get been, been in the past given a chance to find an audience now those days are, are gone is that correct oh i th i think it's very true and and that's again uh another sad thing for truly new filmmakers uh, because uh they've had so much content coming at them that they've decided that they have to be more selective uh, amazon in particular because they opened the doors to anyone. Anybody that could get their film uploaded went up on Amazon. And uh, they started to get heavily criticized uh, by the public in general, that there was a lot of, you it's know, lot. subpar film. There is. And because, you know, and because they want to be considered as good a platform as Netflix or, you know, Google Play, uh, they very seriously decided they, they were going to uh, be more uh, discerning, and 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 they didn't really do that at first by not accepting films. What they did was they were still taking films, but then had to actually compete with all the other films that were on the platform. So that's how they came up with this concept of uh, customer engagement rating. So all of a sudden. They are, you're in a competition with studio films, mm -hmm. if you want to know the truth. So you actually, your film had to prove that it was engaging with an audience somewhere above 50% of all of the other films that were up there 
or you are going to make a penny an hour. And because of that, so many films that were actually were making could be making a decent amount of money at 10 cents an hour. You know, if they were making $1,000 a month or $2,000 a month, that's enough for some filmmakers to live on. But when that turns into $200 a month, you're not paying your rent. With it. Or, or $25 a month. <laughs> or $25. <laughs> right? But I mean, that, but that particularly that class of indie filmmakers that were able to get a couple thousand dollars a month, it allowed them to do... Absolutely. Make movies full time. But to just, when it when that's cut down to $200 or couple hundred bucks you're you're out of you're out of the competition so to speak so um so that was the that's the primary way they've been able to uh i can't i guess knock off uh you know or discourage you know uh subpar what they consider subpar or not non-competing content and and so i think that was the first way secondly they are. Uh, they started to look at uh, actually purging certain films, and if they found, even if you, even if you had a CER, but th they felt that your film wasn't competing, or it wasn't a good enough quality, or they were getting any kind of, you know, uh, complaint from customers, that they would uh, purge it, and without notice, they purge files. So certain files, you know, would just disappear, and they don't send you a notice. They just they're gone. It just they're not right, available. right? Because because basically it's their sandbox and it's their it rules, sure. and exactly. they do whatever the hell they want, and they can care less about the. They truly can care less about the filmmaker, and this is something that has happened with every platform that opens up. At first, the doors are wide open. Facebook, Twitter, mm -hmm. YouTube. Everybody can come in. Everyone can make money. Everyone could do right. everything. And then once they have market share or audience, they start tightening and tightening and tightening and tightening till they all those people that used to be able to get in are no longer invited to the party. Right. And that's what's happening with Amazon. And, and also with Netflix, with Tubi, with all of these other companies where they used to be wide open. Is that, is that right. fair? Sure. Absolutely. Um before uh, we used to, we've had we used to put several films up on Netflix and Hulu. And in fact, our own indie film, uh, the third film that we did, uh, delivered, made probably on Hulu the best money that it made while it was, you know, when it first came out, the first couple of years it was out. But uh, and Netflix was the first to do this. Uh, they have decided that they want primarily original content. So if they acquire something, they want exclusivity. And uh, so now uh, Hulu has also adopted that. So for the most part, unless they really, 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 really want your film, um, they, it's going to be exclusive. And, and, and because they, there's, they pay a flat fee, there's no upside potential. So we don't recommend any indie films do it. Because you're that if you're if you're exclusive with them, you might as well just sell it to them. And in fact, we've actually even said to some people said, "Oh, I have, to, I really have to be on Netflix." I say, "Okay, you know what? Go go to one of the uh, companies like Bitmax or Quiver that will pitch your film. Pay them to pitch your film to Netflix and see if you get on." Because we're not interested in distributing a film if we can only put it on Netflix. Right, and if like if if basically. Oh. You take on a film and they give you fifty thousand dollars for that film, and that's all you can make off that film for the next two years, or depending yeah. on the term of the, of the length of the, of the agreement. Right. That's not really interesting to you. The, there's no upside. No. You can't go anywhere else. You can't make a deal with right. a foreign distributor to right. you know or buyer you can't do to buy. Anything else with it. Yeah, you're, you're 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 done. And I've heard they from. They don't need us, and I want to be honest with them about that. Right, so. I exactly. And from what I'm also hearing from the grapevine, I've heard from multiple producers and multiple multiple producers, distributors, and filmmakers who have been dealing with Netflix is now, and I'm not sure if you've had this experience yet because I'm not sure how much you're dealing with them currently, but now before, like Hulu, when I sold my film to Hulu um, and licensed it to them, it was, a, it was a, I think, a 12-month a, a deal. And it was X, X amount of money, and they would just break that up in quarterly payments during the course of the term. That's right. Now, 
Netflix is starting the payments at the end of the term. So if you sign a two year deal, those first two years, those first two years, you don't get a dime. That's what, I, and I've heard that from, I've seen, I've, I've actually had filmmakers on, uh, or not on, but I've spoken and consulted with filmmakers who've had six, high six figure offers from, from Netflix, but they're like, yeah, it's a two year deal exclusive. And they're like, oh yeah, but we can't pay you for two years. And then at the end of the two years, and then we'll start your payments. And we're like, they just walked away from the deal. Like, sure. they, why would you? Why would you go with a deal like that? Yeah, sure, it's right. Netflix. It's like you know Warner Brothers or Disney. But if there's no money in it, yeah, come on. Right. I know. At at some point, you know, you just have to go. It's, you know, why is it still considered the holy grail? And and it just really doesn't need to be anymore. Uh, so I think that you know, slowly the word is getting out there that you don't have to be on Netflix to be successful and that it, that sometimes even if you go with Netflix that you know you're hurting your film rather than than uh, helping it that you really could make a lot more because we have plenty of films that might have gotten like a $30,000 deal with Netflix but they've made 300,000 in right. the first 2 years right. so you know we 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 are we see our job as being you know, uh, to maximize the revenue that you can see from your film so you can keep making more movies. I right. And that's, that's the point, you know. Uh, I think there are sometimes exceptions where someone doesn't want to make movies. They just want to be a director for the studios. And so they're more concerned with their reputation. It, and, right. And so there are occasionally, you know, if, some, if that's what they want, uh, you know. Then, but that's not usually... Um, the films that we get. The films that we get are usually from filmmakers that want to make movies. And <laughs> make, movies and, and make right? money. But the right. end goal, but the end goal, that's why I always ask filmmakers when they ask me to consult them on them, like, what's your end goal? Is your end goal to, to get this up on Netflix so your, your, your own personal cachet as a director goes up and you can leverage that into getting another gig? Or do you want to make money? And, right. and that's two very different outcomes. And filmmakers have to be honest with themselves about what they – and I know everybody's like, well, I want both. I'm like, well, yeah, sure. <laughs> yeah, we all want both. Um, <laughs> now, do you – like you and I have been in the business for quite some time. And, I mean, I wasn't, I wasn't making movies in the 80s, but I, I've, I'm a student of the industry. And I, and I worked in a video store, so I saw a little bit of mm. what happened back in the 80s, which was that – at, in the 80s, you could literally ch finish almost any movie. If you actually finished it, produced it, and delivered it, it was sold. Right. P period. That was, that, was the, that was the barrier of entry. Now, the barrier of entry to make a movie was extremely high. It, you know, low, low end, we're talking three to $500,000, and that's super low end. We're talking Roger Corman-style right. films at that point. But you could make money as the years have gone on, and the uh, the access to uh, the the gear and the distribution, everything has gone up. More and more people have flooded in the industry. So now, and I'd love to hear what you think. Do you think that you have to be so much more than a filmmaker and so much better at your skill set? to even survive as a filmmaker, meaning you need to understand marketing, you need to understand distribution, you need to understand deliverables, you need to understand all these other tools that you used to be able to just hire somebody to do a lot of times, but you need to have a lot of these tools in your toolbox just to just to make a living, just to sustain you, not get rich, not blow up, not like just to make a living, because before you, you literally, it was like shooting fish in a barrel back in the 80s and the 90s. Just making a movie got you, got you in now, Everyone makes a movie. <laughs> like, so, the, the, no, so, so what do you think? That's why your book is a very, uh, b very valuable because it talks about the need for filmmakers to um, really be entrepreneurs and to really Thank understand you. everything they can do to promote uh, and expand uh, their business with their movie. Your movie now, I think, can be like the core element of a, a brand, you know, or a, a business that you build around your film, but you have got to have the business skills now. Uh, it's really, really important. And I'll go back a little bit uh, to that conversation we were having about uh, curation because now, uh, a, a, and even I'll go back a little bit further to the Amazon situation. Another thing that has happened with Amazon is that uh, Amazon owns IMDb TV. 
And IMDb TV is their AVOD channel. Uh, and it's their move to AVOD. And, and, and that move is very important for them because in the past, they had to pay for all of their content out of their subscription pool. So in other words, everybody would be subscribing to Amazon Prime. Uh, but that money is n not used just for movies. That was like a freebie that you got because you were getting free shipping. Well, there is it's the COVID. Everybody's home. Nobody's going out shopping. Everybody's shopping online. They need that, that money to cover all those shipping costs, distribution centers. So they don't want to use that pool of, of uh, prime subscription money to pay for content. So what do they do? Okay, they just say, okay, we're going to encourage everybody to move over to IMDb TV. Then the advertisers are going to pay for the content. And we don't have to take that out of our pocket. So we're, uh, you know, and we'll talk a little bit more about this whole move to AVOD mm -hmm. and, and what that's all about. Because, uh, but that's, that's why Amazon is doing it. Because Amazon is different than other um, subscription channels. That that's the only business they're in. Is movies generally speaking? Right. Gener generally right. speaking, right. Net generally Netflix speaking. is Netflix. I, I, I've been saying this for a long time. Netflix is extremely vulnerable because they have basically one stream of, of income. I mean, right. sure, they sell an occasional Stranger Things T-shirt or a Cobra Kai T-shirt at this point, um, but that is that is not Disney. Um, right. Disney is a very right. diversified company. Like right now, Disney's entire theme park and resort, which is about twenty five percent, twenty five percent of their yearly revenue we're talking about billions of dollars is shut down but yep. their other avenues are doing their other revenue streams are doing really really well especially yep. disney plus and we'll, we'll yep. talk about pvod later on too because i'm dying to talk right. to you about pvod okay. um, as well so, but, uh, but so to continue that so that's what's happening with amazon mm -hmm. and why part of why they you know made the pay rate so low because that's another you know, encouragement for people to switch to IMDb TV. Now, the problem is that an individual filmmaker cannot get on IMDb TV. Mm -hmm. uh, so that means that all of a sudden we become a gatekeeper for Amazon in that sense. Uh, you know, uh, so it, there's no DIY aspect to IMDb TV. So, uh, and, and they are quite uh, heavy on curation. So when if we submit maybe 50 films to uh, them, they might take 30. You know, so uh, we, we actually have to pitch an avail. Right, and, and, uh, and I want... They pick what they want. And I want everybody to understand, though, that you have had a relationship with Amazon going back. You were one of their first... Years. First films ever streamed on Amazon was yeah. one of your films. So you guys have yeah. a very unique relationship with Amazon. And if they're treating you like that, how do you think they're going to treat an independent filmmaker uploading to Amazon Video Direct? <laughs> yeah. You will you you won't have access to an individual will not have access to Amazon Correct. TV. I don't right. think ever. Right. No, so. that's not that's not that's not smart business on their part. There's just enough yeah. con there's so much content that the studios can dump into Avod. Um, that and I've been seeing it constantly. That they're just like, why? Well, why not? We'll just toss it in there and see what happens. And and there's just so much. The, the good news is that the pay rate on that is significantly higher. It's almost it's almost equal to what the pay rate used to be a couple of years ago on Amazon. So uh, because we're getting a share of the advertising revenue, and so it's it's I comparable to like Tubi. Mm -hmm. if not a little better. So so in the in the end if your film is good enough for us to get you on there, it's you're going to make more money there than than you would have made on Prime. So the, the so the basically you know and, and I know this is I mean I didn't want this to be a depressing episode, but there is some depression <laughs> there is definitely some depressing concepts that we're talking about here and issues which basically are now is a lot of filmmakers are the, under the impression that they could just make a movie, any kind of movie, with no star power, with no niche audience, with no anything, and go out there, make it. And it, and there were ways of generating revenue, like an Amazon, where you could 
you literally had the power in your own hand to upload it yourself, drive traffic there, do some TVOD sales, maybe get part of Amazon Prime. Uh, and that's like low low hanging fruit. Then if you want to go to the next level, you spend it, pay money to an aggregator to put it up on iTunes and Google Play and all these other platforms. And before you could make money, make good money. I've had many filmmakers on my sure. show that have made millions doing doing that. But it seems like now those days are essentially gone. And a lot of filmmakers are still making content or have made content thinking that that's the way the game is played. Because, and I've said this before as well, our industry pretty much stayed the same. The technology aspects of it and the distribution side of things stayed the same up until pretty much the, the late 70s, early 80s when VHS was brought into the game. And then even when that happened, we're still talking about maybe a decade to a decade and a half, like let's say like eight to 10 years, 12 years, 15 years, that VHS was king. Mm -hmm. Then DVD was just another version of that. And that's right. that was king up until the early 2000s, early to mid 2000s. And then streaming, but it seems to now everything keeps speeding up and the change is happening so much faster where before that's it that's took forever to change. I mean, remember, I still remember at the beginning of when I launched the new film hustle, there was still that conversation. This film looked better than digital. Like, oh yeah. You remember that was the biggest thing. And I had that, that podcast about it. I talked about it, like, oh, it's film, the texture, and this. People were still having that dumb conversation, which the answer is it's up to you. <laughs> so <laughs> so the business is changing so rapidly. A lot of these filmmakers are are not if they're not listening to podcasts like mine or reading books that are current they're being left behind and they're getting slaughtered because yeah. you know it, you, you you see films all the time. They come in with a $500,000 budget film with no stars attached mm. yep. with, with you know, barely a good story and they're just like, th th that film will never make money. And, it, and, and unfortunately, sometimes you have to say, sorry, you're the bad guy. Like, sorry, this is the, not gonna work. <laughs> the, other, the other thing is beautiful, important films. Yeah. <laughs> just, there is no market for them right now. Right. Uh, there's not a market for depressing dramas <laughs> right now. Not so much. Right now, people want to be entertained. They want to escape. They, really they want to escape. Yes. Yes. Yeah. They're feeling bad enough as it's on their own. They yeah, and, but, and, and I've said this. Story. And I've said this on the podcast a thousand times. Please, whoever's making a COVID movie, stop it. Stop it. Well, we've. We've had two uh, not, uh, you know, rejected by Amazon. Right. No, nobody wants a COVID movie. I don't want to watch a COVID movie. Do you want to watch a COVID yeah. movie? I see that on the day, on the news every day. It's and it's the equivalent of watching a 9/11 film while 9/11 is going on, or watching a Vietnam film while the Vietnam film's going while the Vietnam War is yeah. going on. Like nobody yeah. wants to, to see this. Some time afterwards. Yeah. And even yeah. then, how many people? Like how many? There was this era of Vietnam films. There was what four, like three, four, nine, eleven films. I'm not sure if there's going to be a moment where we want to go back to COVID. I don't see it anytime soon, at least. The, the only thing that might be interesting is when you have kids that didn't experience it, and you want you want to say, "Here's what it was like." Because you know right. we're going to be the we're going to be like the grandpas and the grandmas in the in the nursing homes right. going, "Were right. you alive in 2020?" And I'm like, "What was that like?" I mean, when the aliens landed in November. What was that? <laughs> you know, it's so funny that you said that because we were having all of us a conversation the other day. We're going, we're going. What else could possibly a happen? Aliens. Somebody said aliens are going to land. So aliens are going to land. No, aliens are going to land. Atlantis is going to rise. Uh, the mole people will finally rise from underground and take over the planet. Uh, blood rain hasn't happened yet. Um, I haven't seen locusts or, or frogs rain on us yet. I mean, there's a handful, but there's not much left. <laughs> there's not much. No, oh, and the meteor. Don't forget very, the, very the comet. The meteor or the comet that will eventually hit us. Uh, so, right. I mean, Jesus. Right. It's, it's an insane, insane world that we live in. Now, with COVID, the other thing is let's talk a little bit about PVOD. And the theatrical, because you used to, um, well, you know what, before I ask that question, I want to ask you one other question. What do you look for? And I want people listening, filmmakers listening, when you're looking at films as a distributor, what do you want to see in the film besides good quality? Because that's, that's, bare, that's bare minimum. It has to be well-produced. But 
as far as actors, genre, uh, niche, things like that. Tell me what you are looking for so people can really understand what a distributor is looking for and what the marketplace is looking for. First of all, you have to have a great poster. <laughs> I hate to be silly, but it's not silly. Great okay. poster, great trailer helps. It, it's absolutely essential. People have to understand that when, when your movies, if you don't have a star in it, the only way people are going to watch your movie, I mean, if you have great social media engagement, that helps. But when people are sitting on their couch, and they look up at their screen and they've got their remote in their hand and they're scanning through, what am I going to watch tonight? What am I going to watch tonight? They have, your poster has to be clickbait. It, it has to grab them. It absolutely has to grab them. So, I mean, I made a joke out of that, but it is super, super, super important. Mm -hmm. So when, past that, and it's not the first thing we look at. Uh, it's probably kind of the last thing we look at. And after, if we like the movie and we don't like the poster, we just say, you got to get a new poster. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> right. So, so that's how that goes in reality. Uh, because I would say probably only if we're lucky, half of the people that submit their films to us have a good poster. Mm -hmm. And, you know, so the word's getting out there that, you know, you need to have a really good poster, but, but, what we look for is something that grabs your attention right away. We're not terribly genre specific because we have very successful docs. We have very successful thrillers. We have very successful dramas. We have very successful crime films. Uh, you know, so it, the story is very important. The acting is critical. The audio is absolutely essential. We, we, we get plenty of films uh, where uh, they look great, but the audio is so bad and, and, that, and that just takes you out of the movie. It's really, it's really, really important. But, but the most important thing is that the movie grabs you quickly and engages you. And, and we, we, so many times we see really good movies that have these slow starts and somehow people get it in their mind, oh, we're going to start slow and build. Mm -mm. No, <laughs> it's better to start with a bang and then explain, right? And then get into the story uh, because people have so much choice now. If you're not engaging right away, people are out of there. We, and, and we saw this. This was an amazing thing that we were able to notice when we were doing screenings in Cannes last year. Because Cannes was a virtual market, all of the screenings that we did, uh, we were able to see how long someone stayed in the virtual theater before they left. And we could see on certain movies, after five minutes, they're out of there. Or after 10 minutes, they're out of there. But the ones that stayed through the whole movie really liked it. But if you don't get people right in the beginning and engage them in the beginning, they're just as likely to go, ah, I'm bored with this, and just move on to something else because there's so much content. Well, I mean, that's the same thing that happens to me. Like, I, we'll, my wife and I now are scanning through old shows like that, that we've heard were good. And I'll, mm. give them, I'll give them, you know, 10, 15. Like, we've literally given a show 15 minutes. And my wife and I go, no, no. And we move on or we watch a movie. We're like, we'll give it a shot and we'll give them five or 10 minutes. If they don't get us in those yep. five or 10 minutes next. And that is for better or worse. That is the world that we live in. So you have to ask yourselves who's the listeners listening right now. What do you do when you're scanning through, through Netflix? And this is not yeah. just like indie films. This is all product, all, all oh, big yeah. Big productions, things like that. Huge. You know, there's there's big giant shows, which will remain nameless because I don't want to get hate mail, that I started and I couldn't get into. I was like, I'm sorry. I know everybody loves this show, but I can't. I, it's not my flavor. And it's not grabbing me the, the same way. Then there's other shows that I watch that are just like, well, I mean, let's just call Cobra Kai what it is. It's it's absolutely genius. <laughs> um, and, and I watched it on YouTube before anybody, you know, I was one of the originators. So everyone's freaking out now about Cobra Kai, but, you know. But anyway, that's a that's a we're on a side note. Um, but but that's the rule. It is so as, as a filmmaker, you need to grab them in the first 
four to five minutes. It's sad that like you don't have the, the Scorsese time to a taxi driver to build it up, you know, or. And one, one of the big mistakes that happens is that I've seen indie films that have 10 minutes of credits. Up front. In the beginning, up front. Yeah. You don't need anything other than the title, the director, and the stars. That's it. Move on. Everybody else's credits can go at the end. And I know a lot of indie filmmakers that go, oh, but my friend did this for free, and this one did that for free. If nobody watches your movie, you don't no make one, any money. No one's going to eat. And you can't make any more movies. <laughs> and, and no one could eat. No one could eat after that. Right. But so, do you, but so obviously. credit's short. Right, and then star and stars obviously, and stars still have some sort of cachet, and faces have cachet, yeah. even even if they don't have a bankable star. Like if Nicolas Cage is not starring in your action movie, you might be able to get a lot of second and third bananas to have good faces to pepper them throughout the piece. That you have a nice poster with faces that people recognize. Does that help? I'm going to tell you two stories mm -hmm. <laughs> to illustrate that. We have um, a comedy uh, called DeMarcus Cousins Presents Boogie Comedy, Boogie's Comedy Night. This film um, has by far and away uh, been our biggest seller. Um, it has done high, high, high five figures for the past three months on TVOD on Amazon. On TVOD? TVOD, yes. But who's, who, Normal. how is he, how is he okay. driving, tra he's driving traffic, right? They're driving traffic. Okay. DeMarcus Cousins, he's a big time basketball player for one oh, thing. Oh, okay. Okay. He goes on ESPN and mentions the movie. Done. Done. Done, day, done game. Done. So, so that's, that's the perfect example of having a name that is willing to mention the film. But but also, but he's not a movie star. He is not, but he That's is a huge celebrity. And you correct. don't, does it need to be a movie star? Mm -hmm. It can be a movie star. It can be a big, famous athlete, a musician, a YouTube, someone with an enormous YouTube following or a huge Instagram following. It, it needs to be somebody famous. And it, and that's the funny thing. It doesn't have to be a movie star anymore. Someone okay. who has an audience. Someone who has an audience yes. that is that's passionate right. about them. That's right. Because um, so you, you, OJ, OJ starring in your movies, he's very right. famous. Not going to bring a whole lot of dollars in. <laughs> no. But so, social media currency. Correct. Right? Okay. So now here's another story. Uh, you know who uh, Vinny Jones is? Of course. Yeah. yeah. From Vinnie Snatch, did. right? From Snatch and very a ton good. of action movies. Uh, yeah. Okay. Well, I have, I took uh, a film called Ron Hopper's Misfortune, uh, which is a beautifully shot and executed and produced and acted love story fantasy starring Vinnie Jones. It's not his. I cannot get anyone to watch that movie. But that's not an action, though, and that's not what he's known for. Exactly. If you're if you are going to pick a star, don't cast him in something that's so far out of his genre, for example. Sure. So it'd be like if you you know uh, wanted to cast a big horror film in in a super serious drama love story, you need to consider that as well. So th that's two star stories. With very different results. Now, I know there's another film of yours that has done extremely well, and the kind of currency that it carries is arguably even more powerful sometimes than having a, f a famous person or a movie star in it, which is The Niche. And The Niche, is, which I talk about in my book a lot, is extremely powerful, the film Netflix versus the World. That documentary, yeah. which I saw and I love, and it, it, I, and I'm gonna have I'm gonna have the director on the show soon, but they the director's so smart because he's leveraging a book, if I'm mistaken, right? It was based on a book, and Netflix, which it's a brand that everybody on the planet knows, and the title of the show, the documentary is called Netflix versus the World. So I'm gonna watch that. I know the story, I read the book, and everything, but 
but that's done extremely well, has it not? Extremely well. And in fact, um, we actually have, uh, we sold it to Japan, and they are actually doing a theatrical release of the film. And they have, they're also doing DVD and Blu-ray, and they also just at, sent us an agreement to sign off on them being able to sell T-shirts for it, wow. which I thought would interest you. Wow. Right? Okay. Interesting. Yeah, for that movie. So, and it's so they're, they're following your plan. <laughs> Which is right. They're creating ancillary product lines. So whoever bought the film in Japan, they're like, wait a minute, we're going to milk every little drop yeah. of, out Absolutely. of this. And what are they doing? They're leveraging the Netflix yeah. brand. Yeah. It's that, And that's what a good documentary, a lot of, not a good documentary, but a, a lot of successful documentaries uh, have done that uh, is by leveraging brands or topics or emotions of a niche audience. Documentaries about food, for example always do well we have v one called fat fiction which is about uh, yeah. a low carb diet yeah. doing extremely well the vegan do vegan documentaries always do well paleo documentaries oh. those kind of things yeah and uh, so there you know there are definite things and and there's the the old favorites genres you know like horror films if they're you know fairly well executed do well mm-hmm Genre films are the exception when it comes to production value. People seem to be more forgiving of the production value. Uh, but but for... Amazon but Amazon might not be. No, no. <laughs> so that we're screwed either screwed. way. <laughs> we're screwed either way. <laughs> well, if it does real, if it does well, you know they're 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 okay with it. But it's it has to be popular. Right, exactly. There was a film a while ago called Thanks Killing. It was a Thanks Killing. I think it was Thanks Killing, which is about yeah. a killer, a killer turkey, um, a serial uh -huh. killing turkey. And this guy, and and this is we're going back probably seven, eight years. A movie like that today would not would be would not get into Amazon. Though that movie, by the way, was was sold to Warner's uh, direct direct digital, a uh, direct uh, like uh -huh. to v, to v, uh, to VOD back in the day, and they made. Hundreds of thousands of dollars. And the movie cost like seven, like seven thousand to ten thousand, fifteen, twenty thousand, or something yeah. like that. And they had T-shirts, and they had, had, but a movie like that in today's world might not even get to see the light of day because on these platforms because they're just going to go no, right. no, we're not we're not into this. Well, we're testing that out right now. We have one called Not Zilla, N O T Zilla, <laughs> that has the. <laughs> The coolest hokey monster in it you've ever seen in your life. Nice. So, yeah, so and we'll, we'll, we'll see. We'll, we'll, it's, a, it's a fake monster movie parody. Right. So and why and not? Let's we'll see what see. happens. We'll, we'll see what happens. Now let's talk a little bit about PVOD because that's been, a, you know, as of, as of this recording has been in the news a lot. Uh, and when I say PVOD, it's premium video on demand, which is – kind of taking the place of a theatrical release or has, or doing it in conjunction with a theatrical release but because because of covid theatrical has pretty much dried up uh you i know you used to have a theatrical release for a lot of your films uh, and you used to be able to leverage that to get better sales and to get reviews and rotten tomatoes and all that kind of good stuff but that's pretty much dried up as well at this point uh is that correct well we have not been able to do a theatrical release since last March. And in fact, the COVID shutdown shut down in the middle of three theatrical releases we were having. So they got to do three days instead of their seven. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, uh, but they did get their uh, reviews. So uh, probably somewhere between a third and a half of our films that we were taking at the time, we would do at least a one, one week theatrical release in Los Angeles. So we could get an LA times review and maybe, uh, you know, uh, um, a couple of other uh, good reviews. And, and, and that would also get you a Fandango page. Right. Uh, because Fandango and their trailers and their trailer promotions are massive. Fantastic. Right. You know, absolutely massive. They have they have a, a trailer channel for each individual genre on YouTube. And they all have millions of followers. Millions and millions of views. So that Fandango was important. And you only used to only get a Fandango page if you 
did theatrical because Fandango was for selling tickets. That's a ticket sale site. That's what that is. Not so, not so much anymore. Well, exactly. <laughs> so, and then, and the same thing, Rotten Tomatoes. If you had a theatrical release, you got, uh, I could get you a Rotten Tomato page up even, you know, a couple of weeks before your theatrical release. So that was, those two pages were very, very valuable um, and popular with, uh, people wanting to know about a movie. Right. And so uh, once the theater shut down with a little convincing, we were able to uh, talk both Fandango and Rotten Tomatoes into putting up pages for our releases, saying this was a planned theatrical release, but due to COVID, <laughs> you know, we right. had to release it straight to VOD. Right. right. So now there's a couple, we have a couple of... Um, alternatives. We have a, a movie called Unbelievable uh, that has uh, Snoop Dogg in it. Mm -hmm. And uh, they had a and this fits into the category you're talking about a um, virtual theatrical. Right. Vir yeah, virtual pre advanced, pre pre yeah. advanced ticket sales. How, right? yeah, how, how'd that and go? It, it went okay. Um, we were disappointed in the number of tickets sold, but I think that um, you have to be very careful about how you design and price those. Uh, there's a company, I think it's called Addison Interactive, that does these for studios. Mm -hmm. And depending on how much money you spend, they actually can be quite expensive, but they will set up like a virtual green room for you so that you can have the stars from the movie actually in this green room and people can interact with them. Right. And, uh, you know, and so, so there's, there's various options and, you know, it, it, it's, if you can promote it well enough to get good enough ticket sales, then I think it can be worth it. Otherwise it could be a loss leader, <laughs> but, um, right. you know, so while we didn't sell as many tickets as we thought we were going to sell, it did, you know, it was an interesting, you know, experiment, experiment to see how that would work. Well, uh, we have, we haven't been as successful trying to do drive-ins. The drive-ins that we have uh, spoken with want stars. They want movies, you know, with names that they can really. Yeah, there's a limited, home. there's um, a limited of um, uh, inventory of screens. Yeah. So. Yeah. They want to be. I, I mean, they didn't just release Hocus Pocus, the movie from the from the late eighties, early nineties, the Disney movie with Bette Midler, <laughs> and it's number one at the box office, made two million dollars, you That's know, crazy. for Halloween. Yeah. So this is the world we. I mean, Empire Strikes Back was Jurassic Park was number one again a while ago. It's it's right. insane. But now the whole the whole pivot conversation has changed because of Mulan, which right. was not because originally Trolls Two did it. But that was a very unique scenario. It was a kid's movie. It was right in the middle of the shutdown. Parents were going crazy. It was a different conversation. Mulan showed up. And from what I understand, the number, the ticket sales numbers is they sold about 9 million tickets. At $30. At 30 bucks a pop. So they ended yeah. up being whatever that is, $270 million, which is 100% theirs. Yeah. Not, not, no splitting with the theater. Right. And a lot of those people turned into a Disney Plus customers because you need a Disney Plus account to even get access to watch, it. To watch yeah. it. So if that's the case, and that's with a movie like Mulan, which is not a franchise film, is right. not, it's big, but it's not like, it's, you know, it's not a Marvel movie. So I'm curious when this, ha when they put James Bond up on like something like that or the next Marvel movie, but I just heard that uh, Wonder Woman is going to go pivot. Yes. So that's a very – because, like, that's a movie that I probably would spend 30 bucks to watch at well, home. You know, if, if you've got – what I would do is I would – I'd invite over a couple of friends. Sure. And, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And have a watch party, right? You know, we've got an 80-inch television and, you know, and you have four people. Mm -hmm. you, you know what? Two people cannot go to the movies for $30. Well, you can if you sneak in your own popcorn and you sneak in your own drinks, well, yeah. and you and you go and you go uh, at at nine o'clock in the morning in L.A. Yeah. <laughs> then yeah. yes, That's other right. other because, than that, I no. mean, otherwise you're spending at least fifty. 
Oh, and that's if that's just that's just two people that don't have kids, that don't have kids. <laughs> no, you got a couple of kids. You're talking a hundred bucks. It's easily so thirty dollars. Thirty dollars is There's nothing. It, it 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 arguably is a re it's not reasonable in the scope of standard rentals that we were used to at Blockbuster or even on TV currently. But go it's it's that or go to the theater. It's going to be a very interesting. The world is changing so rapidly, and I, I, I well, let me ask you: Do you think theatrical is going to come back in the way it was pre-COVID, or is it going to be completely um, different? Because Regal just shut down, like literally yes, just shut I down. I heard that. And by the way, the new James Bond has been postponed till twenty twenty one. Of course it has, of so, course. and and I know not, that's hurting. They're, they're not going to let that out. That needs you need to see that in the theater. It's the last, but it's the but look, Tenant was supposed to be like the savior, and it didn't do anything. Mm. Say, Tenant did not bring mm. people like it made twenty I've million heard bucks. Tenant so. isn't that good, so I, I I know, but based on Christopher Nolan's ba sure. you know past ex yeah. you know movies, you would expect it to do you know real gangbuster. But I think it made total theatrically was like twenty million bucks, which is yeah. embarrassing for a film like that. But a lot again, a lot of films, a lot of theaters are closed, so it's a really interesting dilemma. And Dune, which I was dying, I was actually going to risk going to the theater in December to see, Got has it. been postponed to 2022. Right, exactly. Because there's only so many slots that you could fill because now all these studios, is all these big projects that they had in the can are, they. there's only inventory. so many, there's too much inventory right. and not enough slots. So now, like, and I, and I promise and you it's going to be pushed. That, they can only put, you know, even when they do open, at first it's going to be twenty five percent capacity or something. So it's if not, you're if you're lucky, right? If you're lucky, and how many screens? We're not going to have the same amount of screens as we did before. So it, I don't think we are ever we we and, and I, I, let me I think know what you think. Two years at least before we're back to any kind of normalcy, and that's if we get rid of the virus. Well, yeah. I mean, yeah, and that's a big if. That's a very very big if. Um, because it's going to eventually go away, hopefully with a vaccine and things like that. But this could take years. It, it, you know, it could take years for it to be kind of eradicated, or at least being dealt with like a flu, like dealt with like a flu that it's not a terminal uh, thing. But you know, the the trend with theatrical was going down and had been going down for years. So we all That's knew. Oh, indies! It's yeah, it was is is completely. But even the studios, you could just start seeing the numbers. Marvel, you pull out Marvel for the last ten years out of the theatrical experience, and the, Marvel held Disney held up the theatrical, you know, business by themselves with Star Wars, Pixar, Disney movies, and all the brands that they own. So it's been going down, down, down. I this just just accelerated everything. I think theatrical will always be around. I think it'll be some sort of theatrical. But it will not be what it was before because so, so many people are just like, it's just the same thing as working from home. Before, working from home wasn't a thing. Now, everyone's like, well, this is this is so much better. <laughs> well, except that, you know, I mean, it is a social experience. It's yes. a date night thing, you mm -hmm. know. And so I think for, especially for a young, uh, younger audience, uh, there will always be, you know, Something. a date night thing. You know, you have to, you know, it's, it's. You have to have some courting. That's like our part of our courting process, right? <laughs> First <laughs> to of all, put it delicately. Linda, you're using the word courting. No one uses the word courting anymore. <laughs> okay, so everybody instantly. <laughs> there you go. You gotta, and gotta go, you gotta do dinner and a movie. You gotta go out to dinner and a movie in order right. to get laid, or at least right. to make out in the car uh, right. afterwards. <laughs> All right, so let's talk a little bit about the myth of TVOD and SVOD in the current world that we live in because I've been yelling from the top of the mountain that TVOD is dead. Um, unless you can drive, for independent films, unless you can drive traffic in one way, shape, or form. So the example that you gave, he goes on ESPN, that's driving traffic. That's exactly. That's exactly driving traffic. But if you're an independent filmmaker and you just put up a film with no actors, no star power, um, not even a niche, let's say it's just a genre horror film, and you throw it up on iTunes hoping for it to be discovered, you're dead in the water. So I'd love to hear your opinion on it. Okay. I can speak with authority on this topic because I have over a thousand films on Amazon. Okay. Out of the thousands, Three 
are making anything on TVOT. One is doing high five figures. <laughs> Which we discussed. The next one is making low, low five figures. And the next one is making high three figures. <laughs> high three figures. Yes, that's the hundreds. Hundreds okay. of dollars. And then everybody right. else is making pennies. If, if, if. Yeah, $5, $3, $2 a month. A month it's on TV. No, it's nothing. Yeah. It, it, it's just insignificant. Okay. And and every now uh, that movie, Fat Fiction, uh, it did 30 the first month, then just dropped off to 10 and then dropped off to, you know. In, in, tra in transactional. In transactional. Yeah, in transactional. So what we do is we give everybody two weeks. <laughs> mm -hmm. We put you out there on two weeks. If you don't have any traction, we turn on Prime. Right. Then you start making money. Yeah, and even then, though, now you start, giving minutes. You, start you, you used to start making money. Now, it, now you start getting minutes watched. How much you're going to make depends on how well you engage with your audience. Now, if you're over that 50% mark, are you in the six to seven cent world at that point? Uh, no, it's they've scaled that back even. <laughs> uh, I think <laughs> you, you get you're going to get. Um, You have to get up – in order to make 11 cents, you got to be over 95. And you got to be over 98 to get 12 cents. Jesus it's, Christ. It's very, very – So um, you're, fi you're fighting for you're, basically crumbs. You're yeah. fighting for you're, crumbs. You're, you're four cents at 50 percent. Uh, maybe by the time you hit um, 55 or 60, you're up to five or six cents. You know, but it's a slow – it's a slow rise to the top. But they, so essentially Amazon doesn't want your business. Essentially. Not you personally. I'm talking about just as yeah, a general yeah. statement. Oh, absolutely. They, yes. It, they're, they're, they're weeding out, you know, what they consider to be. Undesirables. Uh, undesirables. Yeah. It's, 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 it's sub studio content, level content. I mean, they're, they want to be regarded as having quality you know, studio level quality. Well, to be, to, to be honest, I've always, I mean, I've had uh, Amazon prime forever and I've always considered Amazon prime kind of like the dumpster of, of films. Like I, I would find occasionally you find gems, but you got to cut through a lot of crap that's yeah. up on yeah. there where Netflix well, is not like that. Hulu is not like that. HBO is definitely not like that. Um, yeah. these other, these other platforms definitely are more curated and right. Tubi was like that originally as well. They let everybody in because they wanted, yeah. They needed content. They needed numbers. But now they're starting to pull back too, which we'll get to AVOD in a second. Um, but all right, so TVOD, so we can now officially say, everyone listening, TVOD is dead unless you can drive the traffic to it right. and sustain uh, it. iTunes, we're seeing nothing. Nobody's using iTunes anymore. Like no, nobody. Like unless it's a studio. If it's a oh, studio. Yeah. Those studio films do fine. Yeah, studio and people still and, rent and people still rent studios, films and and studio and and TV they do, shows and, and stuff. especially uh, young families with young children. You know, couple young couples with young children, so they'll use uh, Apple TV. You know, to, to they'll buy for their kids, and the kids can watch them over and over and over again. Yeah, for but ten. Studio. Disney films, you know. Yeah, ten bucks or studio. something like that, and you're and you're rocking and rolling for for a while. And yeah, I mean, I I've done that kids with my watch kids. The same thing over and over and over again. Yes, they will. Yes, they <laughs> will. Uh, I never want to see Frozen again, um, or hear that song. It's still, right. it's, it's, I still wake up in cold sweats. Uh, <laughs> So, so everyone listening, TVOD is is officially dead. So please don't think that you know. I've had people on the show before who have made millions on TVOD, but it, we're talking about 2012 with one of the examples, and another one was like 2015, and they both had massive either stars or audience that they could leverage. So TVOD is dead. So now let's go over same, to S. Same with Google Play. Well, all TVOD, all TVOD. That's included on all the platforms, yeah. and That's also three major ones. So okay, so I, and that's another thing, another myth that I want to kind of break here today. The 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 three major platforms. If you're going to put up something on the platforms, which are the platforms you need to focus on? Amazon, iTunes, Google. Those were the those are the three TVOD. Right. But but there's fan but there's also Fandango, PlayStation, Xbox, and all these other kind um, of smaller ones. 
don't wait. The Indies on Fandango were doing nothing either. Right. So okay. we have we have prob- we have maybe fifty films on Fandango, and the reason that we even went to Fandango is they were the first one that allowed us to put four K films up. Okay. And we have had four K films up there for close to three years. Not much. Uh, you know, but uh, indie films don't get any play there at all. And, and so, it's a, and, and a lot of filmmakers will go to an aggregator and they'll go, well, I want to be on all the platforms. So they'll spend five, they pay, oh, they'll $5, spend five to grand to be put up on Fandango, PlayStation, yep. Xbox for the pure ego boost to say yep. we are everywhere. We're on Voodoo, we're on Roku, we're on all of these platforms. And a lot of times, uh, most times, you're not going to see a dime of that. You're not going to get an ROI on that investment, no. generally no speaking. ROI. No. We, so, we, do, we still do it just because people... Expect it. Expect it. They, they, they just think it's so important and it's so hard to, talk, to convince them. That's why I hope this episode get seen by everybody and watch and listen to everybody because it there's some there's just realities that are currently happening now that filmmakers are still stuck to the old way of doing things so before it was you have to go out to tvod for what three to six months then you would turn on svod and god forbid three years later you go to avod if there was even a thing so let's go to S, let's go to svod next so SVOD essentially is Amazon Prime at this point because there is Netflix and Hulu, but those are like the cream of the crop get accepted to those situations. Is that fair to say? Um, well, yes and no. There, there are others. Like, for example, um, we're uh, uh, BET. Mm. BET is, is a great subscription channel for urban films, for black sure. cinema. Sure. Okay. And we we have a quite a few uh, black cinema films in our in our catalog. Mm-hmm. We probably have the prime uh, black cinema uh, catalog mm-hmm. uh, because people that want black cinema approach us. We don't have to go asking, mm-hmm. you know, to get on their platforms. So we we've supplied a lot of content to Urban Flicks. Uh, we're in the process of uh, working with BET. Mm-hmm. Uh, and and those are subscription channels. And they te- they buy the way foreign buyers buy. They pay flat licensing fees. However, uh, what's good about subscription channels is that they will let you still be on TVOD. Mm-hmm. You know they don't require a holdback from TVOD. And then usually they will have a set holdback for. Uh, other subscription and AVOD channels. So, for example, they might say, "Okay, we, we, you, you can't go on any other AVOD or or SVOD for three months, for example, yeah. or six months, or something like right. that." Yeah. Right. Or, yeah, yeah. So, so, uh, so those deals uh, are, and there's quite a few subscription channels out there. But oh, they're yeah. Specific. You know, they're 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 genre specific in some way or niche uh, specific. Uh, so, so those those are worthwhile, and we look at those first because they do want that hold back, mm-hmm. right? Or if you're already out on some AVOD, then they're going to cut slash the price down really low. They'll still want it, but they're not going to pay, you know. So it's worthwhile for us to look at those, and we can get an answer pretty quick on those. So it's not a big hold up. And you know, so, and the one thing that a lot of these broadcast channels. Uh, that are now going into streaming plan like a BET, AMC Plus mm-hmm. just got announced. Mm-hmm. Uh, all of these kind of platforms. One thing that these guys want is E and O insurance. So can you talk a little bit about E and O insurance and 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 how you didn't accept it? You didn't not accept it, but you didn't require it. But now some of these old school broadcasters are asking for it. Absolutely, and and it's interesting because any any of the new tech company streaming companies like Amazon, Google, Apple, uh, Tubi, uh, none of those have required E&O insurance because that was our specialty early on, uh, you know, was dealing with tech companies because back when we started our company, we couldn't get a studio to talk to us. (laughs) Right. 
So we 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 were you know we went with the innovators, right? And that boy has that paid off for us. Uh, but uh, you know, so so those companies, whether it was I don't know whether they just didn't know about it or what, but they just never required it. And and I think the primary reason they don't require it to this day is that if there's an issue with something, they just shut it off. It's just it's like a light switch, right? Boom, you're out. You know, and so yeah, it's not like you. you, know, you, you it's know, not like you produce like five thousand or ten thousand DVDs that now you're like, oh man, I've lost all my money. That's right. You can't. There's nothing to pull. There's nothing to retrieve. Uh, you know, and 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 so it's very. It's a very simple solution. And it, the second anyone complains about a film for a copyright issue, it's turned off. Period. Right. And then they'll look into it. So like. Uh, or, for example, many times, especially like after the distributor thing happened, uh, when we first started to try and put films back up on Amazon that had been on there through distributor and other channels, they would say, mm -hmm. oh, no, sorry, so-and-so, that's already been up there by, with somebody else. And so we would have to go through a legal process of, of uh, supplying a copy of our contract to uh, you know, their legal department and, you know, uh, we finally got it down to a, uh, a process that was fairly quick and we were able to do it. But, but that's, that's the solution in the streaming world. But in the broadcast world, uh, old fashioned television broadcast and cable always have required E and O insurance. So now that we are, now that all of those companies are branching into streaming, they're bringing and that I old eventually, they're just going to drop the broadcast. I think that's just going to go away completely. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> I think everything will be streaming within a couple of years. So, but as they now add streaming to their old business, they their legal departments are going. Oh no, we still need to have E and O. You know, so so you know, and they won't let go of it. And the first instance that we had of that uh, was with uh, BET and uh, different. Uh, Broadcasters have different limits um, because they have different experiences with lawsuits. And so uh, one uh, channel might say, okay, we want E&O insurance where every time we get sued, you know, you have to have coverage of at least $1 million for each instance. Others ask for $3 million, for instance, and a BET asks for $5 million, for instance. So... You know, it, and I'm not sure why they set the limits where they do, but, you know, it is, if you want your film to be on one of those channels, you have to acquire that, you know. So we've built a relationship with a couple of different uh, brokerage firms, insurance brokers that, uh, you know, are able to provide that insurance. And it's not that still, expensive. And it's not that expensive. Well, a five million dollar, for instance, with say a twenty five thousand dollar retention, could cost you up to ten thousand dollars. Right. For a three year policy. Sure. And a one year policy, the difference between a one year policy and a three year policy is a couple hundred bucks. So you might as well get it for three years, and then you're covered if something else comes up. So mm -hmm. that's a really important thing, you know, to remember. Is, uh, but uh, but off of a but but a standard one million, for instance, is uh, a one. It might only cost you twenty. Two thousand dollars. Yeah, two to three thousand bucks is generally yeah, two right. Three thousand dollars. So, but you know, that's not always enough. So, you know, you want to. Uh, so again, our 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 advice always is to our filmmakers: don't don't get it until we get you a deal, or yeah. if we if we get you a deal, we'll make sure that the deal will cover the cost of your get. You're getting that E and O, because right. the filmmaker has to get that E and O. Right, right. It's a responsibility. Can't get it for them. Right, exactly. So, yeah, you can't have like a policy, a blanket policy with your company that nope. covers all of them. They won't do that. Nope. Nope. They will not do that. And, uh, and I have to tell you, uh, the, the application, it's about a 10 page application that's really, they ask such really detailed questions. As they should, as they, as they should, you know, and, and if anybody wants to know what an, you know, in policy is, uh, you can go Errors online. And omissions. Yeah. You can go online, uh, on my website and find out, or I'll leave a link about what it is to have talked about it multiple times. Um, but it's something that, uh, you do need to have, 
uh, if you want to start playing with the old school guard, if you will. Right. The new school, they don't care. But let me tell you, I think, as I said before, I think they're all moving into it. Now, Stars has a streaming channel. Showtime oh, has every, a streaming channel. HBO. HBO, BET, Turner. Uh, AMC. Yeah, AMC. Uh, so we're, I think eventually they'll all. And, you know, a, a really easy way to see is if you have a Roku box, go look in their streaming channel store and you will see. Right now there are 953 movie channels. Mm -hmm. 953. And growing so. on a daily basis. Yeah. And growing on a daily basis. All right. So now let's talk about what you've been, I know you've been dying to talk about. AVOD. And uh, which is, uh, I, I would guess, ad based uh, video on demand or advertising mm -hmm. video on demand. Um, Avod was basically the redheaded stepchild. Sorry for all you redheads out there. Um, but uh, the stepchild of, um, of video on demand. And it was like the place where films go to die was with the original concept of Avod. It's like, oh man, if your movie's not making any money or it's just pretty much done, you put, you put it up on Avod or YouTube. Like YouTube is AVOD essentially, you know, but it's just uh, not an exclusive AVOD. It's literally open to the whole world as well. Um, so that has changed dramatically. So can you please tell us your experience with AVOD and how it is currently affecting your bottom line and your filmmaker's bottom line? Uh, AVOD now is providing the best ROI for our filmmakers. Uh, and I think that is going to uh, just keep expanding um, and there's very good underlying reasons for that if you think about it um, old-fashioned television uh, was has always been paid for by advertisers and everybody watched television and everybody sat through the ads or got up and went to the restroom or you know or made some popcorn or whatever you know it was just a part of life you watch television you watch the ads well when the stre streaming came around and on demand where you were paying for it, basically, there was nothing in it for the advertisers, right? They, they, they had no, so they had no interest in it. But when the first A star A AVOD channels started to come about and the very first one that got hugely popular was Tubi TV. Mm -hmm. And Tubi TV, we have been on for more than 10 years. And for the first mm -hmm. eight, no one even knew what it was. <laughs> first of all, it wasn't called Tubi. It was called AdRise. And it was interesting how that happened because we, um, one of our very first channels that we were on or our stations was uh, called Cassie. And in the beginning on the Internet, it wasn't streaming it was downloadable DVDs. Right. So in other words, right, that's how mm. we started this whole journey because the internet wasn't fast enough to watch over the internet. Right. But you could buy, instead of going to the video store, you could download the movie and watch it. Easier than going to the video store, right? Argu so, arguably, the technology was a little bit wonky, right. let's say. Right. <laughs> so, so there were two. <clears throat> Amazon was the first with Unbox. Right. And our movie, Shifted, was the first indie film on Unbox. And then there was another one called Cashy. And uh, it was uh, uh, started by this guy by the name of Tom Hicks. Well, Amazon survived, but Cashy did not because they weren't charging enough. They were giving 70% to the filmmakers, and it was so early that, that it wasn't enough for them to survive. So they wound up, you know, closing that company. Well, then Tom Hicks got involved in a whole new uh, business, and that was the start of AdRise, which is to make advertising-based streaming. And that uh, AdRise became Tubi. And it was only renamed to Tubi, I don't know, three years ago, something like that. And And when we first started doing it, people were just as adamant about not doing AVOD as they were uh, putting your movie, whole movie up on YouTube. 
Right. It was like, oh, you're giving away my movie for free. And I, I still have people that say, oh, my movie's for free on this channel. You know, they, they just don't get the concept that, yes, it looks like it's free, but people are watching ads and you are getting half the advertising revenue, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. They just don't understand that it's coming from a different place. Now, what's happened is that the advertisers now see that everybody's going to streaming. So their way of getting in on the streaming business, right, is to go with these AVOD channels because it's just a, they've created a, a new television. AVOD is the new television. And it's, and it's a better television than the old television only in that you can watch what you want when you want to watch it. You no longer have to be home on Tuesday night at nine o'clock to see such and such show. Or record it on or record it on your VCR. <laughs> or right, use T TiVo, is it? Well, it was called TiVo. That's I'm talking about old school VH, you know, automatic oh, yeah. record. Or, yeah. Record. <laughs> right, right. So now you can just so so it was it's only natural that <coughs> that the um advertisers have glommed on to streaming. And so that's why you see that especially the, the companies, the big media companies like Universal, right, mm -hmm. that are losing their advertisers from their regular linear TV, right, <coughs> they have moved, they watch their advertisers leaving them and going to streaming. So that's why Universal, part of why Universal has Peacock, which is streaming AVOD, right? So it's a way to transition from the old school broadcasting and cable into modern streaming and modern television. So that's why I, I see AVOD as, you know, the, the new uh, frontier for uh, filmmakers uh, to earn revenue. Now, but do, but with Tubi specifically, because there's Tubi and Pluto and there's and I, IMDb TV and Peacock and a couple other ones as well. But when Tubi lots first... Lots of other Lots of love ones, excuse me. Um, and growing, as I'm sure there's five of them that just opened up while we've been talking. Um, <laughs> the, the, the issue I saw was that originally Tubi was wide open and there weren't a lot of movies up there. So any movies that did get up on the platforms, they would get a bigger chunk of the advertising revenue because it was less competition. Now there's a lot more competition on, on Tubi. Are you seeing revenue drop per movie? Nope. No, they're no. not. No. Um, the advertising, uh, it's measured in eCPMs, mm -hmm. you know, per thousand views of an ad, right? Uh, the number of ad impressions, we're getting paid the same amount for the ad impressions that, that, We've always got paid. Mm -hmm. But per title, is it is it a per, is per a, ad? A, no, not per ad, but per title. I'm saying is like the pie smaller per film as it is because before, there, if I say you had ten films up on Tubi, each film would probably get a lot more ad ad plays in a lot more plays because there's less competition. But now that there's so many more, uh, so much more content on Tubi, the ad revenue still might be the same, but the per film might be less. Or am I mistaken? Um. Like any platform, your maybe your top 10, 15 percent of your movies are making 90 percent of the revenue. Right, right. It's the 80, okay. 20, it's the 80, 20 yeah. principle. Yeah. yeah, it's it's that 80, 20 uh, situation. And that's true I, on, on just about every platform that we're on. Mm -hmm. But the actual amount of money we're getting paid, you know, per ad is pretty consistent. Is that and a no, do you mind do you mind asking or is that number kind of classified as far as a per ad? Is it between nine and eleven uh, cents? Dollars oh, dollars. Yeah. Oh, oh, per per thousand views. Yeah. Per, per thousand views. For impressions. For impressions. So that's actually pretty good, and yeah, I it is. that that's actually pretty good, and I've even I've had filmmakers who've decided to put their movies up on YouTube, and if they have a monetizable channel and they have a lot of views. Some of those CPMs I've seen, depending on the on the genre and things, we're talking about twenty, thirty dollar CPMs on their thousand, thousand views of uh, of what you they're doing. Can very definitely make money on YouTube movies. 
Yeah, it, it, absolutely. It's it's fairly yeah. insane. Yeah. But but again, this is the this is this this is where what we're trying to do with this episode is to change people's mentality about right. about what the realities of the world that we live in currently, as of this recording, is. In a year or two, Avon might be old. I don't know. Maybe there'll be some new thing that you and I don't even know is coming down well, the yeah. line. But but for the immediate future, Avon yeah. is where the business is trending towards and and is in. Uh, <laughs> Something that's interesting to note mm -hmm. is that different AVA channels have different demographics. Mm -hmm. So the, my top 20 list on Tubi is extremely different than my top 10, 20 list on Pluto or my top 20 list on IMDb TV. Mm -hmm. It's a very, very different demographic. You'd think it would be all the same, but it's not. Yeah, one movie that does well on one platform could tank on another. Absolutely. Yeah. And and I think why that part of why that is is that 2B was first and it was available to uh, people that couldn't afford cable mm -hmm. and couldn't afford sub a lot of subscription channels. So they watched we're forced to watch with ads. Right. right? And, but isn't, but so isn't. That, and that audience grew. And is growing. So Tubi, yes. And so Tubi <laughs> tends to be that, you know, uh, that audience, although it's changing and people are, other people are starting to change. But, but that's not true of IMDb TV because people at IMDb TV, one, they're getting on there through Amazon Prime. So they're people that had money to spend on Prime. Right. 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 So so it's a again it's a different, different demogra demographic. demographic. Now are and, you seeing are you seeing that the the numbers on these AVOD platforms are starting to go up because we are in an economic downfall right now Absolutely. and and yeah, it's covid people are at home too right and they and they've lost their jobs and they don't have the money right. and they still want to be entertained so they'll download yeah. they'll buy ruku a ruku connection or a box for what what does ruku cost like 30 bucks roku, roku, roku uh their premium box i think is like 60 or 70 dollars uh -huh. and uh or you can get their streaming stick Right. which is a light version of it for, I don't know, 30 bucks. Right, exactly. Or, so, or Amazon Fire. Is Fire Stick. Popular. Yeah, because that's stick. like 20 bucks or there 30 bucks. To, right. If you buy a new TV, it's all built in. Right, it, it, exactly. So it's, so for no money, you should essentially could just, if, if, you've, if you've bought a new TV, if, you, if, if you're lucky enough yep. to have a new TV. But yep. if you don't, you could buy a 20 to $50 box, essentially. Right have access to all the content you want for free, uh, just have to deal with ads. And for somebody in a family that is hurting or lost their jobs or sure. the economy's really hit them hard, Absolutely. this is an option. And it's becoming yeah. more and more so, not only here, but around the world. Now, that's yeah. another thing. How are, how are your sales internationally? And how are, how are you generating revenue internationally? Because before I know Prime was a very big deal for you internationally, but how are you doing it now? Well... Um, every month, uh, more and more people are streaming globally, uh, and every month, um, channels are increasing uh, their territorial reach. Like when Tubi, for the first couple of years, was only U.S., and then they added Canada, uh, and then they added U.K., and now they're adding Latin America, So, and they plan on expanding yeah. so i think we're going to see these streaming channels go global i really do right and and, um, and so but for right now where what are the trends that you're seeing currently in regards to revenue streams coming in for independent films internationally like where are you making money uh, internationally um uk is probably you know english-speaking territory still is probably is the primary but is it no I, I understand but is it like svod is it tvod is it avod what, what is the form Oh, it's it, it's prime because that's where we're in the most territories. Got it. So prime right? is still internationally. Yeah. Prime is still generating revenue for you and your filmmakers. Yes, and prime and and prime outside 
uh, the U.S. and U.K. is not as dependent on that CER. Oh, because they want market share in those areas. So different pay rate. That's right, because they're they're growing those markets, so they have higher pay rates. Right, because they want if they have content in those markets and God so and that's another thing. I think we talked about this privately. If you can have a dubbed version of your film or a subtitled version of film, how does that work? Okay. And does that generate right, so revenue for you? All right. So for we'll talk about Amazon first. Uh, there are sixty eight territories that are English speaking. And so uh, automatically we can put you in all those sixty eight, although we have a tendency, if we think something has the potential to sell at a market, at AFM or CAN, we'll hold off turning those on until we go to the market. And then that way, if we say sell, do an all rights deal for the UK or for Japan or whatever, then we don't then we don't turn those on on Prime. And then after the market, and we know what we can sell and what we can't sell, then we can go back and turn it on everywhere where we didn't sell it, right? So that works really good. So. Then um, if you get French subtitles, and Rev does subtitles in all languages. Right. right. Yeah, I'll put a link, so, to the, I'll put a link yeah, in the very, show notes. Rev is great. Yeah, very reasonable uh, pricing. Uh, French gives you 30 more territories. I had no idea that French was the actual national language in 30 countries still. I mean, they were, they were an empire. I mean, come I on. didn't realize that. I didn't <laughs> know. I mean, I knew they were big, but I didn't realize they were that big. Sure, sure. Right, right. So they were huge. So, so that's thirty more territories, and then for Spanish, you can get twenty-two oh. more. So that brings you over a hundred, just to those three. Mm -hmm. We don't, in general, we don't recommend you doing single language countries like Italy or Germany. Because it's only Italy. Well, Germany, um, Germany is requiring dubbing, and that's expensive. That's expensive. Probably like. Five to eight grand. Sure. Dub. Yeah, because you need actors. You need a yeah. yeah. It's a whole thing. And then same with Japan. Japan, uh, they uh, for to for streaming, it's got to be dubbed. So those for those countries, we try to do foreign sales to buyers. You know, sure. all right sales at the market. You know, and then they'll take care of the dubbing. Right. 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 Um, and and. They, and sometimes they'll actually give you a dubbed version of it, you know, like, and, and same with China. So, so for those three, uh, we don't do with Amazon. We do with foreign buyers. Is China even a, a market anymore? I mean, I know the embargoes really hurt uh, well, the market. They're, they're not happy with the U.S. right now. Yeah, that's obvious. <laughs> we, 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 we've been very mean to them lately. Uh, yes. With the China flu. Yes, that's exactly. And, among other among other things, yes, uh, the trade embargo right. and, and right. The, the tariffs so, and all so that stuff. Yeah. I think that will we'll see what happens with the election. Sure. Depending on who's president, that could change dramatically. Because mm -hmm. uh, so so pre we so have buyers waiting. To, to right. Say. So pre this administration, um, I sold my I sold this as Meg to China. In, uh, in, we in sold forty films to China. Right. So I mean, there was a market for good money. Oh, sure. oh, and it was good money. Absolutely, was good money. Yes. But that, but so it's all dependent on that. But right now, they're still kind of like, are you selling anything to China anymore, or, or not as much? We have, you know what? We've got a couple buyers recently, and I think what they're doing is they're like trying to hedge the market, thinking, okay, we're going to buy now because it's going to open back up, right? Yeah, so that's right. Yeah. All right. So, Let's we'll see. It's it's an ever moving playing field. The rules are changing all the time. The playing field is changing all the time. The players are changing yeah. all the time. And I want filmmakers listening to understand that you have to stay on top of this. Just because you started your movie 12 months ago, mm -hmm. the distribution landscape is not what it was when you started the process of making your film. You have to stay on top of it almost all the time. And the players are changing the scams are changing. I mean, I don't know about you. I heard the other day I had a I had a consulting a client showing me a deal. This company wanted their rights in perpetuity. Oh my god! In like literally as blatant as oh. it was, like so they're out now buying the film, but no money up front. Oh god! No money up front. It was a percentage deal. Oh, that is. Amazing. It was like a thirty-five or forty percent deal for the for them, and then the filmmaker would get the rest. 
and it was a perpetuity. It was in perpetuity, and I'm like, oh, and no, and no expense cap, and no expense cap. I'm like, oh, so you'll never, you're just, you're basically just giving them your movie. Oh, right. okay. You get it's a gift. It's a gift. It's a, you're very generous. You're very very generous, but this is the kind of stuff that's happening all, uh, all all the time. Um, so in the future, where do you see? I mean, I guess we kind of answered that question, but in the future, do you do you see Avod as a, a, a place for filmmakers yeah, that's going to be the I main? I think for the foreseeable independent uh, filmmakers, sure, right? You know that that Avod and and some Svod. Uh, and know, some and TVOD if you have an audience and you can drive traffic. If you if you have if you can drive to business or you have serious names, mm -hmm. then you can get away with uh, TVOD. Now, uh, but it's let me ask you one question. This is a this is going to be a hard question, so feel free not to answer it if you don't want to. Um, <laughs> the The question is, what kind of budget? Like if you have a three hundred fifty thousand dollar movie, if you have a five hundred thousand dollar movie, can you expect to generate an ROI on that investment through AVOD specifically, or or just AVOD, or just like basically the revenue streams that you're talking about without selling international, without like, what's the what's the boiling point where you're seeing like you know what I'm really I mean if your movie is over one hundred fifty two hundred and again in this case by case basis I know that every movie's different. But generally speaking, if it's a hundred thousand dollar movie, you have—I mean, obviously, if you have a ten thousand dollar movie that has Nicolas Cage in it, you have a really good chance of <laughs> making your money back. So the lower the budget, always better. But there's a balance. So I don't know. What, what do you think? I I think that if you have a decent film that you spend a hundred and fifty thousand dollars on, you can expect to recoup in a couple of years. Right. But if you're having, but once we get we start getting into that half million. Six hundred thousand. You really have to. You have to. You have to have all, all uh, cylinders firing at all times, oh, yeah. hitting perfectly yeah. every single time. Yes, unless there is something going on in the market that makes your content valuable. An, an right anomaly. Now. For example, an, an anomaly, basically. Well, our black cinema. Mm -hmm. We have lots of films. That make three, four, five hundred thousand dollars. Mm -hmm. Okay, it's an underserved market right now. Right. Right. So, how long that will last, I don't know. Right. right? I mean, well, Tyler Perry so, built an entire empire off of that niche. Exactly. <laughs> I so mean. you know, so it it the answer is it, it depends. So it you don't necessarily and none of those have stars. Right. They don't have any stars in. You know, a couple of them might have some uh, Instagram um, celebrities. Rapper. Yeah, but 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 in general, it's it's not necessary for them to be successful. It has to be a good, still has to be a good story and have good production value. Mm -hmm. But right? that's but generally that's not enough right. anymore. <laughs> <laughs> right. It's, it's you not. know, but you know, but. That is an underserved market, and and we see quite a bit of success for that, you know. So, all right. So, what advice would you give a filmmaker that is going to sell their film in today's marketplace? I would keep. I would not do anything more than an ultra low budget, right? If you're making a SAG film, uh huh. Hundred okay. hundred thousand and below, hundred fifty thousand uh, and below. No, it's two fifty. Is okay. SAG uh, okay. ultra low budget? Right? Okay. So I wouldn't go over that. If you could, if you don't have any names, I wouldn't go over a hundred grand. Um, we have a new mo new movie coming out. It's supposed to have a theatrical release in, at Arena on the thirtieth mm -hmm. called Blood mm -hmm. from Stone, mm -hmm. and it's a contemporary vampire film, mm -hmm. uh, and meant to be you know a Halloween release. Uh, but as of today, the theater is still not open, so it doesn't look like it's going to be open on the thirtieth either. <laughs> so, so we don't know. There's a very slight chance that we, in the next two weeks, because California is one of the few states that actually has a very low infection rate right now. Cur currently, as we as yeah, we speak currently. right now. Next week. So I don't know. So anyway, if it doesn't, uh, then we'll then we'll just forget about the theatrical and go straight to um, straight to VOD. But that you know that film 
uh, we were able to keep uh, in low six figure. And that's, you know, you have to do that. Very low six figure. And I think that we'll be fine. No, without stars. Doesn't have right. stars. But it has genre. But it's genre. Right. It's, it's, it's sub niche of a genre. So it's it horror and it's yeah. vampire horror. So yeah. like zombie horror or ghost horror or. Right. Yeah. Right. I would stay away from relationship genres. I would stay away from Cabin in the Woods. It's that's, there's, yeah. so, there's yeah. certain ones that are just so tired and overdone. Right. Right. That, um, you know, and I would not reach too far into serious subject matter right now. Like, don't go too deep. We've gotten, we've gotten probably, I would say, in the past six months, maybe 20 really beautifully done movies about mental illness. But yeah, nobody wants to see that right, right now. now. I just think it's a very, very hard time. But it. but with documentaries, but, but, but documentaries with that same topic might do better than a narrative. Or you're saying none at all, even with documentaries. I, I wouldn't even do it with a documentary right now. And, you know, again, we have several of those. And it's just, um, uh, you know, I think people are more receptive to that when they're when we're having better time. You right. know, then they can be a little more contemplative and look at some serious subject. But but right now, you know, uh, people are suffering enough in their own life and it's uh, they they need something that's uplifting. And that is why if, if, if you guys are watching, you guys know that I always have a Yoda in my office, my my, my trusty co-pilot in life um, in the 70s. Uh, which I was I was born in the seventies. I'm not that old, um, but I do. But um, from from history books and films, I I've seen that in this the late seventies, in mid to late seventies, it was a really dark time in our country. It was, economically, we were rough. The Nixon thing happened. The war was going on, and there was these dark, depressing taxi driver and and you know the Godfather, like these really just heavy films. Then something called Star Wars showed up. And everybody was like, oh, my God, yes, I want to escape into a galaxy far, far away. And that's where we're actually in right now. We're in a very dark time in our in, in not only our history, but the world's history. And it ain't over yet, folks. <laughs> we don't know. We don't know where this train's going. It is, it is a dumpster fire that's wrapped in a, <laughs> in a train that is just careening down a dark tunnel. And we have no idea where the exit is or where the exit is. So True. it could be another year. It could be another five years. And I don't want to say that, but oh, don't say it. I know I don't want to, <laughs> but I think that movies moving forward, you really got to look at the marketplace. And I think you're absolutely yes. right. You have to create content that is going to be uplifting. That's going to be escapism. That's why the Marvel films do so well. That's why the superhero, that's why superhero films have been doing so well. It's complete yes. escapism. Yes. It's complete escapism. Um, so it's, um, it's an, it, we're in a, we're living in a very interesting time, Linda. <laughs> <laughs> I agree. The but I'm least. glad, I'm very glad that I'm, uh, you know, in this particular part of our industry right now, because it is the part of the industry that is suffering the least. And we are able to, uh, give people something that can allow them to escape and, you know, there's very little entertainment right now. There's no sports. There's no concerts. You know, there's no theme park. So at least we can be putting out, you know, we feel good that we're putting out movies that can entertain people and, and um, you know, like help pass the time. Now, one last question I want to ask you. Do you, do you, because you're doing very well, but you've been, you've actually yeah. been prepping for this moment for the last decade and, and plus. Yeah. So you were in the online, hey, this is the future thing, as long as I've known you, and, and, and many years before that. So you were primed to take advantage of this moment in time and, and what's coming down the line. So you're actually prepared. A lot of other distribution companies, especially the older ones and especially the, the larger ones, were not prepared and aren't ingrained and don't understand this side of the business nearly as as much as a company like you. And also, you're a small 
lim- limber company. You can pivot very quickly. You're like a speedboat where a lot of these guys are giant carriers that take days and weeks and years to kind of even make a slight adjustment. So you are perfect kind of company to be in this moment. What do you think is going to happen to the distribution side of the business? Do you think that you're going to start seeing companies crash and burn around you like it, like in 2008? Because I still think we haven't even begun to feel the economic hit yet. So when that happens... I absolutely think that we are going to lose probably half the distributors out there. And the reason I say that is that anyone that's been in business, you know, like more than 10 years, Mm -hmm. and there are many of these companies that have been around for 30 years, Mm -hmm. right? Those ones that started 30 years ago, (laughs) they have big offices in Beverly Hills. Yep, overhead. Mm -hmm. They have huge Staff. Uh, staff. They have warehouses filled with DVDs <laughs> uh, and screening rooms and all of this huge overhead. Uh, I don't know how they can survive. I, I, I just don't know how they can survive. And because they're so late getting into the streaming business, there are very few of these companies that do what we do in-house. Right. Okay? We, we take in films, we QC them, encode them and deliver them to the cloud now. We have a cloud-based inventory system uh, where we manage our content in the cloud. So um, these other companies, they're still... They have deals, output deals with labs and post production. And they're still companies. sending out hard drives. And they're sending they're sending the films to them to get encoded and, and delivered. So that's a huge upfront expense that they have. Now, granted, they're recouping that from uh, the revenue that comes in on the film. Oh, from the fi- yeah, the film the filmmakers aren't making that money. <laughs> the filmmakers aren't making that money, but also with this eighty twenty thing. Most of their films are losing money, so they're spending a lot of money that they're never going to even recoup themselves. Right, right, and okay. that, and and we still haven't and we still haven't. I feel we still have not hit the bottom. Our economy is still right. not at the bottom. No, we have it. So so now that we have our our have all of our our content residing in the cloud, if a new big, uh, you know, channel comes to us and says we want three hundred films. We could literally send them an email with a list. Like, say somebody comes and says, okay, I want all your horror films. Mm -hmm. Say 300 of them. All right? I can, with an email, deliver that. Because I'm just sending them a link to a a bunch of buckets on AWS Mm -hmm. that they're going to grab those films from. And if they're a tech, good high-tech company like we are, they, they just, have AWS, and it just goes bucket to bucket in the cloud. And never even... And no, never use the internet. Never download. It's all within no. the system over there. Yeah. It's all within the cloud. It's cloud to cloud. Instead and, of B2B, it's cloud to cloud. R- right, <laughs> exactly. And a lot of and, these companies... And like, like last year oh, when we went... I don't know anything about it. Last they year don't. when I... Look, look. Last year when I went to AFM, you and I were both on a panel. We're going to be on panels this year again at, at the virtual AFM. Um, I was walking around AFM. It was, I think it was about 40 or 50% less people. Uh, I think it was down 60% as far as vendors are concerned. Um, and I literally was walking over cor- carcasses of dinosaurs. Like you can, like you could see the old school distributors with the cigar. They look like they're 105 years old, talking like it's 1985. I would see it, and then you would see it, it, it. So those guys, they can't survive in this environment. They are barely were surviving pre-COVID. So do, and you just said something very interesting. You said 50% of distributors, and that, by the way, that also can include some very big distributors. Big. Big, big companies that, studios, that could yeah. easily go down as well. Um, who do you think is going to go down with them? The films and the filmmakers that they have in their catalogs. The back money that has to come in. Because when it goes down, the ship goes down, they're going to take everybody with them. Like Just like when Distributor went down. Oh, yeah. We're still waiting for money. We're still yeah. waiting for money on that. 
So it's going to be a very, very interesting time. And I think it's going to be a very sad time for a lot of filmmakers uh, as well as the distribution company. But the distribution company is going down. But do you have any hope that after Rome burns, because I've been yelling that Rome is burning for a long time, <laughs> after Rome burns, the new system that will come up around it will be something that will hopefully be better and have more access and can benefit filmmakers more than the current system. Because the current system that's been around since Chaplin's day was never designed to help filmmakers, was never designed to help make money for filmmakers. Do you think this new system would, is there a chance for that? I, I, I don't know. I think it's almost part of being a new filmmaker. It's like you have, you have to be abused. You have to be taken advantage of. Got it. Got it. It's like your apprenticeship, you know. Wow. You struggle in the beginning. Right. Right. And it's like, who is it? Uh, Malcolm Gladwell says you need ten thousand hours to but, become an expert. At but to be, but to be fair, Linda, even <laughs> professional filmmakers are having problems making money with their films. P filmmakers have been around for 10, 15 years making money with oh, their. Yeah. So it's it's not just the newbie that's going to get no, abused. No, 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 that's true. Um, but the people that, that are going to survive are the ones that educate themselves and stay, uh, you know, stay educated on where the market is and, mm -hmm. and, and stay up with new technology because that's, that's what's happening. I, I would not be shocked to see a couple of the major studios go down. Oh, no. I don't I, I, care whether it's Paramount. So I mean, we've already seen Fox go away. So four, four, and I've said this before, and I'll say it again. The four companies that are vulnerable are Paramount, Lionsgate, Sony, yeah. MGM. Yeah. They all have massive libraries, massive libraries that someone like Facebook, Apple, Amazon, or Google can Netflix. come in and buy. Netflix is also a studio that is vulnerable. It is vulnerable, I think, and could be purchased by – Apple could come in and buy Netflix. Yeah. Uh, the only studios I think that will survive this without being touched is Disney, Warner's, and Universal because they have the most yeah. diversified business plans. Right. They have the most diverse. So those are the ones I feel go. I, I mean, there's no. Why hasn't MGM been purchased? Like just for their library. Yeah. Sony. I mean, if you read that book, The Big Picture. Oh, yeah. I mean, yeah. I mean, Sony's. Um, the only thing keeping Sony alive is their television department. <laughs> Yeah. And the occasional I, James Bond that comes out every five freaking years. Yeah. And it's, you know, the, 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 the old studios, they let uh, the tech companies just like they came in and took over. over. Netflix they changed the game. Them. Netflix. I was saying this the other day. It took Disney 10 years to release Disney Plus. 10 years Netflix had a head start because Netflix streaming started in 2010. It sucked, but they started in 2010. It took 10 years. And then now everybody at now, because of Disney Plus, and everyone started to jump on the bandwagon in 2019 and 2020. But it took them 10 years to get going. So all these other companies and, such and Universal, hearts. Peacock's the only, I don't see a Warner Brothers, you know, channel. No, it's H I HBO, HBO Max. That's Warner Brothers channel. Yeah. It's HBO yeah. Max. And... But, uh, and they're leveraging a very, very good brand. HBO is an yes, amazing brand. It is, but Warner Brothers was a great brand. It was, but you know what? And now 20th Century it's Fox gone. and 20th Century Fox is gone. Like that brand yeah. is gone. Disney erased it. 20th Century Fox. So now it's 20, I saw the logo for the latest Ryan Reynolds movie called The, yep. the, the Good Guy. And it says 20th Century Studios. And the logo, the the old school 20th Century Fox logo, but at the beginning, because it's a, it was a, it was kind of like left over in their purchase. Right. It's called 20th Century Studios now, until it's gone completely, until the, all these films come in and go out. It is, who in their right mind would have thought that Disney could buy Fox, and yeah, everything yeah. that I mean, that's an insane yeah. thing. <laughs> so it's not beyond someone like Apple who has I don't know 400 billion cash, ridiculous cash, yeah. cash. They could they could buy Disney. <laughs> they need to do something because Apple, iTunes and Apple TV are just not doing it. No, they're not. But they're they're waiting. They're waiting in the wings. And they look AMC. Amazon was going to buy AMC. Oh, someone's going to buy Regal. Someone will buy Regal, yeah. and someone will buy AMC's. And a lot of people are like, well, why would they buy a movie theater chain? That there's no money in that. I'm like, no, there's a difference. If have you been to the El Capitan? Of course. That is the model. 
That is the model that makes premium sense. Premium theaters. Pre- not only premium theaters, but what do they have? They're film entrepreneurs. They've got an entire yeah. Disney store next door. Yeah. Yeah. And they have, and it's an event going in there and they have answers. So all of a sudden, and if they own the theater, guess what? They own 100% of the revenue coming in through the door. So they don't have to share it. That is a business model. And there's a lot, it's the whole, our landscape is going to change dramatically in the next two to three years. We shall see. We sh- it is exciting. It is terrifying all at the same time, Linda. And Linda, we feel very confident that we're going to be around to enjoy it. So I, yeah, you've positioned yourself. Excited. You've positioned your company in a way that uh, is um, I- that you'll be able to survive. And even if something comes, there's going to be some things that you guys are not going to be prepared for. You're small enough of a company that you're lim- you're just you could just box and weave. You're not this big giant bloated beast yeah. that's going to take forever and you have bureaucracies to go through and stuff like that. No, you just like. You know what? We're moving this way tomorrow, and that's and you move, yeah. and, we um, and, and and that's and that's the and that's the difference between a smaller company and these large conglomerates. Um, but listen, listen, we could we can continue to talk for a while, but I appreciate you taking out the time because I know you are extremely busy right now. I am with a ton of stuff. AFM is coming up as of this recording, and MIPCOM has started as well, and all of that kind of stuff. So I truly appreciate you taking the time out to talk to us. Uh, and and give us the latest updates on the realities of the film distribution business as it is today. So again, thank you so much. I will put links to everything to how to get in touch with Linda uh, on uh, on the show notes. So Linda, thank you again, and give my best to Michael. You guys do an amazing job over at Indie Right. So thanks. And I want to thank you very much for the opportunity. It's always great to have a chance to you know through you talk to our filmmakers, uh, you know our future filmmakers and and be able to share some information that helps them to navigate these murky waters. Shark infested, as I like to call it. Shark (laughs) infested. Thank you again, Linda. 